it's definitely changed, and, and that was alluded to in the keynote as well. Um, so we'll talk about some of those trends as well. Um, by the way, my name is Dan Faltisco. I'm a channel sales engineer with Sophos, and everybody can hear me, right? I'm normally a pretty loud guy, so I don't even need a mic half the time. Uh, I cover uh, the Mid-Atlantic region as well as the Central East region, and um, I live in Cleveland, so I came down the 77 to get here last night, and um, it was a nice scenic drive. I love driving through the mountains of West Virginia, so um, thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit about the survey, um, the state of ransomware uh, 2022. Um, this was not done by Sophos. This was done by uh, an independent researching organization called Vance and Bourne. And, um, you know, they send out a survey once a year, um, which we commission. And uh, this year we got back about 5,600 respondents across 31 different countries. And, uh, you know, as far as size of company, we try to keep it in our sweet spot, which is that 100 user to 5,000 user range. You know, that's, that's really where we play as, a, as an organization. So that's what we're mostly interested in hearing about. Um, the survey was done back in January and February of this year. So this is mostly the highlights. If you wanted to read the whole report, and you guys are more than welcome to, um, you can literally just Google State of Ransomware 2022 Sophos, and you know you get a PDF. It's pretty long. It's got a lot more information in here. I'm just going to give you all the cool, quick hitters. Right. The first one was that uh, you know adversaries are becoming more successful in uh, encrypting data, not just launching attacks, but also in actually succeeding and encrypting that data. So we saw a raise of about nine percent, eleven percent. Um, year over year, and the actual successful encryption of data across the, the, the polls and across the people that we, we polled. Uh, and then subsequently, we saw a decrease year over year in the amount of extortion only type of attacks. So, you know, we, we're going to lock your data and then demand a ransom. So, this goes hand in hand with what was talked about in the keynote, what they're talking about. It's not just about just holding you for a ransom anywhere, it's also we're going to hold you for a ransom and we're going to exfiltrate the data. You might sell that data. We might, you know, sell it back to you, right? You know, there's a number of different ways they can monetize that information once they have their hands on it. And then this goes towards uh, the conversation about when you pay the ransom, you know, the assumption is that you're going to get your data back. No. Guys, don't pay the ransom. That's number one. Don't pay the ransom. That shouldn't even be an option. But if you do pay the ransom, you know, the assumption is, well, I'm going to get my data back. That's why I'm paying this ransom. 61% uh, of the time, you'll get some data back. How many, anybody want to guess how much time, how much, how often people get their full data back? Zero? It's higher than zero. It's higher than zero. Two? A little bit higher than that. I'll, I'll, I'll thank you for your audience participation. <laughs> It's actually down year over year, but it's about 4% of the time they get all their data back. You're paying this ransom and you're not getting all your data back. Take that money that you would have done and invest it in a good backup system, in a good cybersecurity system. It is becoming more challenging. Um, this is, you know, from the words of the people that got hit, right? They're getting hit more often. They're getting hit again, right? You have to pay the ransom and then six months later, they get attacked again because they didn't adequately clean out or remediate that threat. Right? It's becoming more complex. Right? We're not just seeing the phishing attacks that lead to an automated scripting attack. We're seeing people taking advantage of exploits, what we call a no-touch breach. They don't touch anybody at the organization. They just get in through an open port, an open exploit on a publicly available server which, spoiler alert, is what I'm going to talk about in a little bit when we talk about the Black Cat group and how they got it. And the recovery is becoming a, it, it's becoming more complex. About a month to recover. Now, by vertical, this, this changes, right? So the slowest, if you can imagine, is actually higher ed and government. Shocking, right, that government is the slowest to recover. Sorry for anybody here that's on a government agency, but I think you kind of know. You kind of you, you, you can agree with me. It's okay. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, the, the fastest one. So, by the way, the, the average was a month, right? Um, higher ed was about three months to recover, right? So, these are major universities or, or you know community colleges, right? So they just have a lot of disparate systems all over the place, so it's it's tough for them to cover. Centralized governments just have a lot of bureaucracy, and that's why it takes them longer to cover about two months. 
Interestingly enough, the fastest ones were the fastest for exact opposite reasons. You had manufacturing and production as the fastest to recover, because what does manufacturing and production do? Just reimage the system. Oh yeah, that one blocked out. Okay, great. You know, I'll reimage it. I don't care what's on that system. It's on a shop floor somewhere, right? Doesn't have anything too important on it. Maybe they just don't care. Financial services, you would imagine they would be the fastest to recover as well, right? But that's because the opposite, the opposite. They have all the procedures in place. They have all the compliance rules that are forcing them to have a good recovery plan in place. And they're just financially motivated to recover faster because the longer they're down, the more business they're losing, the more money they're losing. So now let's talk a little bit and shift a little bit and talk about this Black Cat ransomware group and you know what they did after uh, they uh, you know breached into a system and and then uh, you know got the ransom. So so what happened? So the, the Black Cat ransomware group, which we'll talk about who they are and you know what what the background is on them a little bit. Uh, they broke into a school and encrypted a U.S. school, not the one I'm picturing here, but a university. We'll just say that. I'm not going to name names and shame anybody. It's nobody in West Virginia. Don't worry. It's on one of the coasts. Uh, they demanded a $600,000 ransom, which was negotiated down to 100000 and then paid by the school, by specifically the school cyber insurance policy. But then what happens next will shock you. Social engineering, guys. Sorry. So who is Black Cat? Well, the, the reason they get the name, they actually, internally, they're kind of known as Alpha, with the under, you know, with the, with the V instead of an A. That's what they call themselves. But they also are known as Black Cat because when you go to a Tor browser and you go to their site, there's that little icon of a Black Cat in their, uh, in their you know, ransom note. So this is like this is a screen grab from, from their site. When you go to the Tor and you launch into their site to get the ransom note, this is what that looks like. Um, they were first seen around November 2021. And so we suspect, you know, they've been active since that time as an organization. Um, as you may or may not know, right, a lot of these organizations, they, they're very nebulous in, in nature, right? You know, who's, who's working for who and, you know, who's got what and what infrastructure are they, are they, are they using and all that stuff like that, right? Uh, they primarily target Windows systems. They have ransomware that targets that. They also have ransomware that targets ESX um, hypervisors, they also have uh, Deb a Debian and Ubuntu version of ransomware. Um, they go after schools a lot, and the schools like using Ubuntu on their in their labs. Um, but they also have some some specific stuff for some storage backups as well, like ReadyNAS and Synology. So, so they're pretty sophisticated as far as the the number of targets they can hit, um, as well as um, you know. So we 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 think they're a possible rebrand of dark side and black matter, or combination of them. We see a lot of familiar infrastructure from those groups being shared. Okay, some similar networks, some similar connections, right, uh, of groups that they work with. Um, but they are very sophisticated. So th this is one of the first ones, what kind of makes these guys unique, um, at least for now, is they're one of the first ones to actually be coding in Rust, which is a, you know, a more secure, newer technology, and new, newer programming language, whereas, you know, Things have evolved from Python now to to this to you know whatever Ruby on Rails and C plus plus and all this stuff in the back day. I used to program. I used to do Pascal and you know C plus plus and Java. And now it's all this new stuff. Glad I'm on the engineering side now. That's all I got to say about that. Uh, but due to the fact that they are one of the first ones to actually have some ransomware written in this new language, we need to give them a high level of sophistication rating. They're not just copying and pasting code. Um, so let's talk about the actual attack. I'm going to go through the timeline of what happened here. So the initial access was through a log4j vulnerability. Is anyone familiar with log4j by a show of hands? I'm sure everybody had to go through and patch all their systems. And that was real fun, right? Back in December, I think, around November, December time frame last year. 
quickly note, um, this attack, you see a timeline. It's hard to see because of the screens and everybody's sitting so far in the back. Um, June 2nd is the date that we saw the initial access happening. So June 2nd of this year. So think about that. That's six months-ish of unpatched public-facing Horizon server with Log4j vulnerability. So you can imagine where my recommendations come in after this. Uh, persistence was set up with WMI. Um, it was set to execute a command every 15 minutes that connected to a Cobalt Strike loader that was posted or hosted on, on Pastebin. So that was the persistence mechanism that was established once they got that initial access. Uh, and then we started seeing command and control. Uh, note, and again, it's hard to see, um, there's a 22 day difference here between the initial access and that persistence mechanism being launched and the actual command and control beacons that we started seeing afterwards, right? So we started seeing some Cobalt Strike beacons on the 24th, which was a Saturday. You know, they love to hit you on the weekends because they know nobody's there. Um, this also is kind of indicative of what we think might be happening is that the initial access was done by a third party and that access was sold to Black Cat. Or they bought that access from a database. So I don't think, we don't think Black Hat was actually the ones that, to do the initial access and the persistence. They were just the ones that happened to be like, hey, can I uh, get a couple uh, schools that we can launch a ransomware against? Yes, please. Use their affiliate networks to do that. Now, from this command and control, there's some rapid fire stuff happening, right? So we see execution of some PowerShell commands that are used to connect up to a command and control uh, infrastructure and then download some additional tools. We see RDP actions, so internal RDP. This is not, you know, you know, they didn't have RDP exposed to the internet, but obviously internally they were using RDP and didn't have that blocked off. So they were using those tools against them, living on the land. We saw some more uh, COBOL strike beacons, this time going to another place, and then it was renamed as SVC host. Very common thing that we'll see. They like to obfuscate what they're actually launching so that it's looked like it's just a normal system process running. Started installing some other remote access tools, some things like AnyDesk, Splashtop. These are tools that system administrators might use. So again, they, they try to use those tools against you. And now the collection, this is interesting, right? So the collection was done with WinRAR and WinZip or 7-zip, rather. Um, they installed those applications on their file servers and then tried to extract those files or, or zip up those files. They got about 10.6 gigs of data all said and done. And so remember that number, 10.6 gigs of data is what they were able to, to exfiltrate or get. They tried to copy a student database. That student database was about 400 gigs worth. The problem was, for them, was that student database was actually in use, and so they couldn't extract that file. They couldn't uh, copy that file because it's, the database was actually in use. So that, that failed. But it's important to remember that database was 400 gigs. They only got about 10 gigs all overall. Could have been a lot worse. This uh, actor did not luck out in this case. After that, they uploaded it to my favorite site in the world, mega.nz. So mega is used by a lot of threat actors to stage stuff. If you guys remember Kim.com and all of his drama. That's his, uh, his file sharing site. Still around, still being used, and you probably should block that in your networks. <laughs> says nobody needs to use that for legitimate reasons. Um, and then after they extracted the data, um, this is where the fun starts, right? So now we're on the 25th. So this is Sunday now. Um, now they start going, okay, well, we extracted the data. We exfiltrated it. Uh, now we're going to go start looking around. We're going to start poking around. We're going to SSH into a number of other hypervisors, another number, a bunch of VMware servers, and start understanding what's out there. We're going to use .exe. We're going to use ping to start doing some discovery on the network. Um, you guys can see where this is going. 
They're trying to figure out where they can go. Um, we're going to set up a scheduled task called Chrome. Guess what? It's not launching Chrome. It's going to point them to their domain controller slash net logon slash chrome.exe. That chrome.exe is actually the launcher for their ransomware. So they did it with an Active Directory GPO policy script to start on startup. Pretty, you know, I would say a pretty unsophisticated way of doing it, but it's very effective. And so, uh, you know, Sunday, about 5 a.m. in the morning, um, the ransomware is deployed to 420 or 450 servers and 1,200 endpoints. They also, you know, targeted the VMware hosts with a, their own Linux variant. That was more individually. We stopped it on the endpoints. They did not have Sophos installed on the servers. I'm not going to name the company they had on the servers. I'm not here to bash anybody. Um, so the whole reason we were brought in in the first place was because we stopped it on the endpoints. And they called us and said, hey, uh, we got hit. Um, you stopped it. Thank you. But, but um, our servers are all encrypted. What can you do to help us out? So we brought our team in and started doing this forensic analysis, getting the root cause, and that's how we know all of this information. Interestingly enough, afterwards, they stuck around. They used a compromised account that they already had access to to create a new user called Administrator, not Administrator. You know, huge tip there. And promoted that person to a domain admin. So you can see what they were doing here. They were doing that for, for one of two reasons, right? Uh, you know, we suspect they were doing it to monitor for post ransomware activity. Um, also, they were trying to maybe be persistent so that they can launch another attack in six months if they don't get discovered. And then the ransom note was left behind. Introducing who they were, what they did. You can't see this here, but in the ransomware note, they claimed to have exfiltrated 500 gigs of data. I wonder where they got that number from. Remember I told you before, they actually only got 10.6 gigs of data. But that student database was about 400 gigs itself. So they thought they got the student database too. Or at least they knew that they could say that they got the student database. You know, the school had no idea. They, you know, they read this and said four, 500 gigs of our data, they must have gotten our school database, our student database. We have to pay this. So lesson here, um, these guys will lie. They won't be honest. And they, you know, don't trust what they say. Don't take everything that they put in their ransomware notes as face value. Do some investigation. Find out what the actual impact was. So what happened next? Well, they're in, you know, the school's incident response plan went into play. So I guess what their incident response plan was. They didn't call us first, actually. They called their cyber insurance company first. That was their incident response plan. Hey, we've been hacked. All right. I used to, you know, before I was at Sophos, I was at FireEye Mandiant, and one of the, the jokes we used to say all the time back then was like, we're usually the third person that an organization calls. The first one's to their lawyer, the second one's to their cyber insurance, and the third one's to Mandiant, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's, that, their whole incident response plan was call our insurance company because they, they were, were covered. Cyber insurance company then engaged a number of different organizations. One of those organizations that they engaged was a negotiating organization that negotiated the ransomware down to 100K from 600K on their behalf. And then they paid that. The insurance company paid it. Then after the fact, they were contacted by Sophos because we saw a bunch of alerts in their console. And we said, hey, um, we think you may have been hit with ransomware. And they said, yeah, actually we were. Um, well, would you like us to come in and help you clean that up? But we didn't know they already paid the ransom. They said, well, we're, we're in negotiations with our insurance company, but yes, please come in and help us. So that's where we came in. We did this remediation. We found out, you know, the root cause and all that stuff like that. That's how we know so much about this. When we were out there doing our rapid response engagement with this organization, um, we found this nice little thing. Report.txt was uh, left behind by Administrator, the administrator password person. And, um, and it's very interesting and very telling what you see in this document. And uh, hopefully you can read some of this, but if not, I will try my best to read it for you. 
So these points should answer most questions. If you want to know anything else or have problems with decryption, please let us know. Very nice customer service, by the way, by these guys. Uh, you had an old critical log4j vulnerability. That's what. That's how we got it. Uh, this is how we were able to get it initially. It was bulk scanning. It's not like we were targeting you intentionally. That's a lie. Because again, we suspect that they weren't, Black Cat was not the ones that did the actual initial access. We think that they, they had bought this access from a third party. So they were targeting education markets. We know Black Cat does. They have special variants designed for things like Ubuntu, which a lot of schools use. So yeah, they were targeting them somewhat. Maybe not this school specifically, but they just made it easy. They were low-hanging fruit. Once inside your Horizon virtual machine, we dumped credentials, got the domain admin, cracked the hash, and were able to move laterally. Yeah, I love this part. It is absolute madness to have 3,000 computers all on the same domain. That's what happened in this organization. They were all on the same, same domain. You should segment your network into other things like teachers, faculty, financial, etc. You get the idea. So if one domain is infiltrated, somehow not all the infrastructure will be compromised. So this is a you know, university organization. It's a community college. And uh, they had everything all in one domain, one flat domain. Also, subsequently, one flat network, too. So, of course. Also, you should routinely review sensitive information like passports, bank accounts, and so on to have them on different domains. So, how were they able to get some access to some of the passwords? Guess what teachers like to do, or you know, administrators like to do sometimes? I'm going to have a little file on my computer called passwords.txt that I'm going to keep all my passwords on because I can't remember things and I don't want to bother with you know something like Bitwarden or KeyPass or whatever those things though. Here's a tip. Do a directory slash s slash a and look for you know asterisk passport asterisk or just pass because that will get passports and passwords. You'd be surprised what you find in, in an organization by doing that. So yeah. Yeah, password, passport.pdf, I see those in organizations doing forensics. I see password.txt, password.excel, right? I've, I've seen one that says, keep it secret.xls. It's like, well, at least it wasn't named passwords.xls, right? But it was still a, it was a list of all their passwords. For their whole domain, by the way. That was a, that was a domain admin that didn't want to trust their, their, uh, their password management tool. Uh, even better is when you have a password management tool, but then you keep the password for your password management tool on a text file somewhere. It's like, okay, I'm just going to throw the key right there in the open for anybody to see, right? have seen that before, too. Uh, once the network was scanned, we went for the backup servers, which you should have on a different domain under five different keys and two-factor authentication. I don't know about five different keys, but certainly securing your backups is important. So I, I tend to agree with them a little bit here. Um, what I don't agree with them is on the next sentence where they say, oh, yeah, don't use any massively used backup software. It's a gold mine for us. It's kind of like implying that they have like some ways to get around backup software. Oh, well, you know, use backup software. Just make sure you test it and you, you secure it. Uh, you know, can't go deeper on that. Ooh. But don't use any of the big names. Okay. Yeah, whatever. They lie. Don't trust what they say. I used to work at a company called Acronis, right? You know, and uh, they do backup software. You know, it's all about making sure you have a good, good system in place to support that backup software. Make sure you test your backups. Make sure you actually try to do a sample recovery every now and then, even if it's just once a year. Test that you can actually recover from your backups once a year. You have no idea how many organizations don't do that. All right, so in this point, it should be clear to you that having a database of passwords for all service, services and services on the local network, it took us a few days to verify the credentials and make a plan of attack. So they had a, you know, again, a, a database basically that was open that had all the passwords for the domain. And I had to put this in here because it was a nice shout out to us. We have to say Sophos was good AV. 
However, no one monitors the logs on your network, and at least they don't do it on the weekends. Now, notice I, I mentioned they got hit on a Saturday and a Sunday. Right? The best AV in the world, the best endpoint protection in the world, the best EDR and XDR tools in the world aren't going to do anything if nobody's looking at that data or taking action from that. We could do only so much. General recommendations. Install hard to, arrive, hard to override antivirus such as SOFO, Silence, I don't know why I want to blank those guys up. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, having a good AV program, a good endpoint protection is, is, is very vital, right? But it's not the only thing, right? Obligatory two-factor authentication should be enabled on the input. I, again, some of this is broken English, right? Basically use two-factor authentication for anything that's system critical, if you can. Using an EDR or XDR tool set, right? That's the term now is XDR, right? Um, having some kind of a managed services to monitor that for you, especially if you don't have your own 24 seven by 365 shop to do it. Those are good suggestions because it's useless if you're not, not looking at that stuff. N another one, another shout out. I would say for your organization like yours, Sophos is good. But no need to buy 3,000 licenses. Just throw it on the servers. You don't need to worry about those stingy endpoints. We don't care about those things. Throw it on your DC and file servers. They don't even say all your servers. They just say just the DC and file servers. So again, these guys will lie. Please don't just install us on one piece of your environment and that's it. Try to get it a good endpoint protection solution, whether it's us or others, on everything in your environment. AV is not magic, right? Even with SOFOs, we can bypass it. I agree. We can be bypassed if you know what you're doing, if you know the, the ins and outs of it. Uh, but it will stop most of the attacks, and it's more important that you hire someone to look at the logs. Yeah. I, I do. I, I do get paid that. To tell people that, <laughs> uh, whenever two, you know, two-factor authentication, hammering home that you know, at least for domain admins, got to have some two-factor authentication. I would say for anybody with access to system critical services, absolutely. You should have trained people looking at this data. Okay, we get that point. Here we go. It's been an honor working with you. We have to say we don't like to blank over schools or kids. This is just business. And it's being a cheap lesson for you. Again, broken English here. It's being a cheap lesson for you. You can't have thousands of PCs on the same domain with insensitive files or with sensitive files accessible to anyone and without anyone monitoring your logs. We are just money motivated. No offense, basically. Our bad. Thank you for your $100,000 that you got the insurance company to pay. And by the way, if this didn't tip you off that they didn't really know who they were targeting, this is a U.S.-based school. And the, the last line of their thing is like, best wishes, keep up the good maple syrup and trucker protests. <laughs> they didn't even know who they were hitting. They thought it was a Canadian school. And of course, they signed a black cat. <laughs> if it's out there, it's out there. Maybe they were doing trucker protests. I don't know. So that's that's my fun my fun story. You hear about that straight from their words, right? What's most important? Multi-factor authentication, securing your access, right? Making sure you have good backups. Making sure you're actually looking at the logs. Make sure you're collecting the logs. So let's talk a little bit more about the role of cyber insurance and shifting back to that survey that we had. Um, we have about ninety-two percent of our respondents said, "Yeah, we got cyber insurance." 83% of them have cyber insurance that covers ransomware specifically. But then 34% of those have something called policy exclusion. Anybody here work with cyber insurance? Do you know what a policy exclusion may be? I see some people going, I have no idea what that is. Policy exclusion is basically saying, hey, yeah, if, if these certain conditions are met, we're not going to cover you. So let's do the math real quick. About less than 50% of our respondents actually had what I would consider true cybersecurity insurance because it covered ransomware with no exclusions. It has gotten harder to secure. Cyber insurance companies are in it for the money too. 
they're trying to mitigate their risk. And so they're pushing down more rules. They're pushing down more requirements to get this kind of coverage. This is forcing businesses to adapt. We have to you know, increase our security posture in order to qualify for this insurance. So the biggest one in the last two years has been the requirement of two-factor authentication. What we're starting to see now is more of a requirement on EDR or XDR tools and the actual ability to look at that data. You have to actually prove to some insurance companies, and some are, some are requiring it, some are not. Everybody's different. Um, they're actually requiring that you prove that you have a monitoring plan in place to avoid things like what happened to that school. Here's the good news. They almost always pay out something. 98% of the time they paid out. It's a pretty good rate, considering only 83% actually had cyber insurance that covered ransomware. Most of the times they're covering things like cleanup costs. This is the cost associated with, you know, uh, bringing a company like ours in to do remediation or, you know, cleaning it up yourselves or the, the, the lost business that you would have, right? The, you know, all that stuff that goes into the cleanup costs. Um, and actually it's a trending down, We're seeing less paying for the ransom outright. Still about 40%. And depending on your country and, and the cyber insurance company that you work with, it could be lower. Um, but we are seeing that, that trending down. And by the way, don't pay the ransom. All right, so to sum up, it's a, you know, ransomware is still a challenge. That's why, you know, the keynotes about ransomware, my talks about ransomware, you're going to keep hearing it until it goes away. Um, I would say other than ransomware, probably business email compromise is the next biggest one that we see all the time. That's where somebody, you know, gets access to a mailbox either through Office 365 or some other way, and they use it to do a social engineering attack internal to the company. Hey, send me over some gift cards, right? That kind of stuff. That's probably the number two, but ransomware is absolutely number one. Our team that comes out and does these rapid response engagements on about 90% of the time, we're responding to a ransomware attack. Um, but it is getting better. You know, we're, we're, our tools are increasing, our capabilities are increasing, and that's being driven by cyber insurance. Cyber insurance is requiring us to have these tools and have these, these methodologies in place and um, in order to get coverage. So we're, we're up in our game collectively, which is good. Still not the end of the day, though. We're still going to have a little bit more to go, and who knows what's going to happen next, right? What's the next big thing to drop? Because it is a cat and mouse game. We all know that. Our top five tips, unlike this, uh, unlike what Black Cat recommended, make sure you have good, high-quality defenses across your whole state. That's not just endpoint, but also you know in your network, on the inter-network scanning, right? looking for that stuff like RDP access internally on a Saturday morning. Probably not an admin working, I would say. Might be a bad guy. Proactively hunt for threats. It's not just enough to get the visibility from the XDR tools. No, obviously, visibility into what's going on, that's what I call suspicious, but not necessarily malicious activity, right? Your PowerShell usage and things like that are happening. Gathering that data is one thing, but actually proactively threat hunting off that data is is a key thing that needs to happen. Work with a services partner if you can't do it yourselves, but you have that capability. Have a incident response plan and hopefully it's better than just calling my insurance company. You know, it was talked about in the keynote about doing tabletop exercises. I love that. You know, get everybody in the room and and, and actually make them tell you what they're going to do in the actual incident. No better way to test whether or not they actually know what they're talking about and they just haven't just wrote up a document and that's it. Test it. Same thing with backups. Still your last line of defense. Make sure you test those and make sure you test restoring from those specifically. So that being said, I'm all done. Like I said, I'll give you back some time in your day, but I'll also be here for questions. So any questions before I end officially? Yes. Absolutely.
Yeah. I, I do another presentation all the time. I talk about getting the best bang for your buck, right? So SMBs, especially, you know, you know, what do they want to cover as a priority? Because you only have so much funds, right? Um, I always say, look at where the attacks are coming. Number one vector of attack is still email. So protect your email is number one. I say 1A, 1B, right? 1B would be your endpoints because all attacks eventually hit a server or a desktop on your system. So if you had all your, you know, if you only had limited funds, where do I invest those funds in from a pure protection perspective? Email and endpoint. From there, then you look at things like firewalls, that telemetry, maybe getting that log collection and, and stuff like that. But that's all, you know, at a premium for SMBs, right? And as, as I mentioned before, that's where service provider partners come into play. You might find a more uh, attractive option from a managed security provider or something like that that can bundle those solutions and their monitoring service into one kind of like monthly fee. That makes it a lot easier for you to operationalize as a, as a small business. So yeah, absolutely, those are the things I would recommend. But if you had, no, if you had very little money and you know, all you could do is invest in one or two things, email an endpoint. Without the policy exception, yeah. Yeah. Policy exclusion, policy exception, whatever you want to call it, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think I get where you're coming at. And so the question or the, or the, the, the statement is more around, well, yeah, these insurance companies will insure you, but do they always pay out? And they'll find a way to not want to cover you. And one of those things could be like, well, it's part of the discovery process, right? Part of the remediation process. They find out that the way they got in was because you had a 20-year-old unpatched server. Well, guess what? That insurance company is going to come back to you and say, eh, sorry, you're disqualified. We're not going to cover you. Yeah. And, and a lot of security, yeah, a lot of cybersecurity insurance companies are being more, uh, more adamant about proving ahead of time before you even get coverage. That's why it's so much harder now to get cyber insurance company coverage like that. Um, so they are being more adamant about, hey, it's not just enough to fill out the form and say, yes, I do, I attest to this or whatever. Um, he, you actually have to show me your audit logs or your audit reports and things like that. We're, we're seeing that. You know, I'm not on the cyber insurance uh, you know, board or anything like that, but I have, seen, I have seen instances where insurance did not pay for our services after the fact, because they we found out that they were running you know, Windows Seven machines that are no longer able to be patched, they were end of life two years ago by Microsoft, right? So you know we've seen instances of that happening in the cyber insurance company, but yes, you're definitely seeing them becoming more proactive. The cyber insurance companies be more proactive about forcing you to prove that you're actually on your game before you can qualify, because they're trying to mitigate their risk, right? They don't want to pay. Any other questions? <laughs> I maybe maybe at some point uh, I you know and by the way that 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 note was exactly the way it was written and they they put Sophos in there like two or three times they put some other vendors in there I, I blanked them out just because you know Sentinel One Silence all those guys right those stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, um, in fact, you know, in the Conti leak, you know, there was some chatter, there was some stuff that we took from marketing for Sophos. There was a whole thread in the Conti leak of them bitching about how much we were stopping them from launching their ransomware. Um, so yeah, it, it, you know, we do a really good job on the protection side, right? But it's not 100%, as you can see. You know, they'll find ways around even our software, especially if nobody's looking at their logs. Now, they, they were able to launch an attack in two days, right? But if 
they hadn't launched the actual ransomware, I bet you they could have been sitting there for another couple of weeks if they wanted to, because nobody was monitoring their logs. So if they wanted to play it slow, they could have found a way around our software and, and been able to encrypt every machine. They were looking for a quicker payout, though, and they got it. Uh, any more questions? I appreciate everybody's time today. Thank you all for coming today and enjoy the rest of the uh, show. Thank you. This talk was a part of our 2022 Secure West Virginia Lucky 13 Conference. If you would like more information about this talk or our speaker, check the description below. And if you enjoyed the content, consider liking and sharing this video. For more information on Secure West Virginia or you want to stay updated with the latest upcoming events, follow us on Twitter at SecureWVCon or visit our website SecureWV.org. We would li also like to thank our 2022 sponsors for being a huge part of Lucky 13's success.